Napa know-how. If you're a fan of quality parts, Napa's a fan of you. And we're showing the love all week long with double points for Napa Rewards members. Not a member? Not a problem. Just sign up when you check out to get double points in your entire purchase. But don't wait to get rewarded. Double points and Sunday. Quality parts, helpful people. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how. Offer available July 16th through July 22nd. Hello. Thank you for tuning in. You are listening to ByteRadio.me's Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. For network or show information, visit www.byteradio.me or call 843-808-0777. And now, the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show with your host, Robert Sharp. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this edition of the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. Today, my very special guest is Hilary Ramo, and we will be talking about her new book, The Hilary Ramo Trans- Show Transcripts, and talking about her work, other work as well. Hilary Ramo has a unique combination of life experience that qualifies her as an expert on following one's dreams. With a background in business psychology, real estate, and insurance, Hillary has bridged the healing arts throughout her traditional training. As a Reiki master teacher, a non-denominational ordained minister, author of three books, and longtime well-known alternative media radio hostess, Hillary is also an award-winning photographer and artist. As her love for the creative process expanded over the years on the air, Hillary guided, mentored, and coached new radio voices as she helped people seeking to birth their, own, their voices and viewpoints into the world. Hillary has led groups to Egypt and Sedona, as well as traveled the world photographing landscapes, her favorite being the old growth forests in Ireland and British Columbia. You can find out more about Hillary by visiting her website, which is HillaryRamo.com, and that's H-I-L-L-A-R-Y-R-A-I-M-O.com, and I do have a direct link to her website in the show page description. So with that, I'd like to say welcome to the show, Hillary. Hi, Robert. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It is my pleasure as well. Um, I enjoyed reading your, your, the transcripts um, in, in your book. I learned so many, so much. I mean, it was um, it was wonderful. So um, I'm looking forward to talking about them. But I have to start with the fact that you, you know you've been doing radio for such a long time. Um, so how did you go about choosing the 20 conversations in this book? It has to have been quite a challenge. Oh, it was. You know, you mentioned you mentioned in your intro some of the things that I do. So I, I have always been doing different things along the lines of radio. So it's always been an interesting balance to um, – going and and motivated and inspired all those years because, as you know, alternative media is not so much well-known, but yet it is at the same time. And I really believe that the power of alternative media grew over the years, and I was very lucky and and happy to be a part of that. So that said, when I went through my 13-plus years of, of work, my whole body of content was over 700 hours. I started in terrestrial radio in upstate New York on AM Talk Radio, did that for a few years, and then I switched over to online radio um, because the world was evolving and we were becoming a, a digital age and it was the opening of a renaissance of sorts for people to have access to information. So the Internet provided a wonderful platform for all of this to take place. The things that have changed over the years have caused me to kind of retire from it at this point, meaning that we have a lot more control, we have a lot more censorship, and once 
the internet in general and alternative media became known as a kind of power changer. You know, you would know this too because you're in the industry, but it became a, an alternative way for people to reach different kinds of information, different perspectives, listen to people that maybe may not have been so well known, but they had a great platform and ability to bring alternative information into the mainstream consciousness. So over this past decade, including 2012, we've had a really interesting timeline or of sorts of different ways that people can create, people can access, people can help participate. And all of this has led to much, much larger platforms of access to information, which if you allow that to grow too big and you're the leadership and you're in charge, that can become a great threat. And so in the, in the energy of inspiring the earth and, and people on it, we really have to take an honest and accountable look at where we are. So when I went through these 20 conversations particularly, I was looking for what conversations over all this time, so many different ones to choose from, so many great and wonderful guests, how do I pick these 20 conversations? Well, I started to take a look around the world today to see what was going on. I always watch the headlines, but I always go a little deeper than just the headlines because if you stick to the headlines, they're very, I don't know, they can trick you sometimes or they can be very swaying. And we all know that. Anybody who participates in social media knows that when you're scrolling through your news feeds, your attention span usually only lasts as long as it takes to read the headline. And very rarely do we click on the link to read through the article to see if the information, what the information actually Actually says, but even more so, we definitely don't go looking for the source or fact-checking, so we take a lot of the information that comes into our awareness, into our consciousness, as fact. And that has become a tremendous problem because as we're watching play out on the collective stage right now, we're seeing certain things pop up and happen that we all have an opinion and a feeling about. But how many of us actually take the time and research to go deeper into the information to see what's really going on? So I chose the topics in order that they're presented because it leads you through a roadmap of different kinds of realities and perspectives and opinions. Um, you know, the book is not about me, but it's my work. So providing a platform for these 20 conversations to take place was my part in it all. So when you read through reality, perspective, changing, sort of shape-shifting conversation to time travel conversation. Time travel, you say. Who the heck talks about time travel? Well, Dr. David Lewis Anderson did, and he actually was in the private sector before he was taken into the government se sector. And he had proven and talked about publicly back in 2010, he was doing the alternative media talk show circuit, and he was sharing the fact that his company, his research efforts had actually uh, revealed that data can be traveled through time, backwards. It was a backwards thing and had developed to that extent where they could send data back in time, which opens up an extremely interesting platform for a conversation, I would agree. And then if you move forward to Chapter 17 with um, NASA physicist Tom Campbell, you start to see how consciousness can be read through kind of a data sourcing technique that he teaches and is well known for. So I chose these 20 conversations, a long way of explaining it, but I think it's important. I chose these 20 conversations in order that I did because I felt they give a reader a concept of time. It's like a time capsule. And if you go through each of these conversations and read them, really read them and let them sit, then you can look around your life where you are now and you can take, uh, you know, you can have an opinion about some of the things that we're facing a little bit more different than what maybe you're being presented with or what's in your face as far as mainstream media information, even alternative media information, because I feel like a lot of it's been infiltrated and I've been very open and spoken about that because when I was in it, you know, 
we all got along, everybody was helping each other, and then it became very compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And everybody has their clique and their people that they associate with and the ones that get invited to conferences. It becomes very clicky and collusional, and I just decided that we've kind of lost our our way. And I got out of it when I did because I was really enjoying my artwork and exploring my talents as an artist. So I, I prefer that energy to other things. And then when I wrote the book, it was really a testament to my legacy, my work, my body of work over the years, and uh, what these guests contribute to each person who listens or reads their show or their words or hears their voice. I mean, I did do a little study before I published the book. I put some transcripts out on my blog, and I asked for reader feedback. And the, the biggest feedback was overwhelmingly that it was better to read this information than it was to listen to the information because in listening we often get caught up in voice and personality and and glitches perhaps in how we speak, our ums (laughs) and and all of this other thing. And video is even Mm -hmm. worse because when you do a video nowadays, everybody's staring at, you know, whatever you got going on and sometimes it's more of a distraction than it is an aid in helping to present something important. Um, but so that's how that's how the process evolved for me in my career and where I am now. And doing the book, I felt like it was a very timely um, time to give this information out into the world again. Because sometimes we have very short memory spans and we don't necessarily remember um, what's important or what we've already heard. And I've had a lot of people tell me in reading this book that they knew a lot of the information in the book, yet they Still, re- they learned something new, or it enhanced it in some way, or it brought some things back, or clicked things together in a connect the dots kind of way, and that is exactly the intention of why I wrote this book. Yeah, well, you know, it, for me, I had the very exact experience. You know, that there were topics that were covered in your book from the guests that I might have had, you know, varying degrees of awareness about what you know, about the topic. But as I was going through and reading your book, there were many things that I learned. Um, and, and it was a, a deeper dive in, into those topics. And and you're right, reading versus hearing. I mean, with the book, you're able to, you can stop. I mean, if there's something that was posed by a guest comment um, that you maybe you, you resonate with or, or that maybe kind of causes you to stir, you can stop. I mean, you know, unlike the the uh, audio where it just keeps on going, you you don't have that opportunity to really absorb and, and process some of the information. So I agree with you there that the, the reading of it um, of the information poses a, has a lot more pluses than simply listening or and or watching um, watching it. So um, now you, we've we've talked a little bit about you know alternative media. So I'm not sure if many of the listeners know the distinction or, or, or what a description of alternative media would be. So would you mind kind of sharing the distinction between that and, I guess, just uh, regular media? <laughs> sure. It's a good question. Well, if you had asked me that question five years ago, it would be very clear to both of us what alternative media was. But I think in the last few years, especially in the post-Trump era, we have watched a very um, precise and accurate assassination of sorts on the entire industry. Why? And I've talked about this quite a bit recently, because I believe that alternative media helped to get Donald Trump elected. And here's my theory on that. Alex Jones, at the time of the campaign, was the largest uh, alternative media host, if you will. He was talking about the anti-government movement, conspiracies, lots of very uh, rah-rah, in-your-face, blatant kind of accusations towards the New World Order, the Illuminati. We had all of these words, these concepts get 
injected into the consciousness over the last decade as the digital age was being manifested fully. Because remember, this, you know, when these shows were taking place, we were watching the launch of the Internet in ways we had never seen before. We were watching the forming of Bitcoin and blockchain technologies. We were watching the implementation of surveillance systems that go way beyond anything we've ever experienced before because of 9-11. My book has two extremely... Um, useful conversations with Dr. Judy Wood, who is astoundingly credible in her abilities to understand the structural elements of 9-11. And she was very quickly laughed at, very quickly criticized. She had a whole bunch of people come into her space and really harass her because what she was suggesting was so alternative to the mainstream idea of what happened at 9-11. So that's how I'm going to answer your question. You have two different types of people in this world. You have people who listen to the local news and the evening news like it's the Bible, and they go by every single thing they hear and see on that. They worship CNN and MSNBC and all of the mainstream media channels as gospel, and it's become quite a a religious, cultish type thing, if you will, because they don't let anything else into their awareness unless they've heard it uh, in some of those channels. Alternative media at the time was like the other way of, of being with that. You have different perspectives, like Judy Off, Dr. Wood offers these incredible alternative perspectives to the physics of the field within 9-11 as it happened and how the structure fell. This is her specialty. We are talking about a woman who is so extremely educated and specialized in this that everybody on this planet should have been listening to her and taking her seriously. But because it didn't fit the status quo of a story or the agenda behind that, it was quickly demonized and hushed up and criticized, and even people within the alternative media world who were all about alternative perspectives on world events began to turn on her, too. Um, Not everybody, but there's many, many people out there who respect her work, read her book, which was absolutely life-changing. My son at the time, uh, a few years after I talked to her, picked up that book and could not put it down, and I think he was 11 or 12 at that time. Um, So he was really interested. And so when you have minds that are connecting to information and having revelatory type alternative changes happen within their psyche because of the information that's coming in, you're talking about power. And mainstream media, not everybody's bad. I have friends in mainstream mainstream media, you know, people are doing good work within the industries. Many times these industries change strictly because of the light bringers who go into those industries and whistle blow or change or help to create different kinds of energies that come out of that. Um, For example, I was just at the ESPY Awards in LA uh, this past week and I had gone into Hollywood and it's the furthest thing from what I'd like to do, to be totally honest (laughs) with you. Um, But I had, I, I I really believe it's how we see things, how our thoughts enable us to create and experience reality. And if you can go into these bigger places and not be sucked into it and really hold your center, uh, I think that's a pretty big gift. And, you know, I accept that gift of mine, and I have an ability to be able to go into these different harder topics. And some of these conversations are in my book. And be able to talk and have conversations without getting caught up into, you know, the, the whimsical, emotional attachment trigger type thing that these information, this kind of information usually happens. Like, and Trump is a perfect example of that phenomena. How many conversations can yeah. you have today about Trump and not get it going into a, oh my God, screw him, he's such an ass. <laughs> right? I mean, really. That's where the conversation goes. I'm, gonna, I'm here I'm, to tell I'm, you, I'm right Robert, I'm, I'm here uh-huh. to tell you that is specifically designed to be so. Hmm. Wow. Now, designed by whom? I mean, how, marketing, how, how? propaganda, okay. marketing, mm-hmm. propaganda, things that go on. I'm not. I'm not taking sides. I'm talking about this from a very objective perspective. Right. When the mm-hmm. campaign mm-hmm. was going on, let me just give a little background into that because this some listeners might not understand this. People who have followed my work will get it, but people who haven't will misunderstand that that. 
statement. When the, con- when the ca- campaign was happening, I was writing a book proposal for Cambridge University's prestigious Nine Dots Prize competition. And the question we all had to write a book proposal around was how do modern day technologies make politics impossible? So I was watching the campaign from alternative media perspective. Watching Donald Trump go on to the Alex Jones show, booked by Roger Stone, who's now a major figure in the media today, because they're saying he was associated with some things. And if you go Mm -hmm. back to that, he ignited an audience of millions of people, millions of people. He was talking the conspiracy talk. He offered a glimpse of hope for the people who have really started to believe into the New World Order and Illuminati consciousness, which is pretty much has become the main thread through alternative media. Now, you have healing shows like yours. You have shows that are popping up to bring up the light and bring the vibration up and make everybody feel better, and we need that, and thank you very much for doing that. However, most well-known shows that feed the ancient aliens uh, circuit, that go into all these different – it's very much like an alternative Hollywood Mm -hmm. They've become like celebrities of the alternative history, alternative media, alternative everything, UFO industries. All of that has become very popularized by shows like Ancient Aliens, which, by the way, is in many number of seasons, right? We all watch it. Most people (laughs) can say something Uh about it at this point. But you have to understand Uh that I interviewed many, many of those people very early on in their careers, And it just seems, and some of those interviews are in this transcript book. And so when you have a progression of personalities going through, like the the five-star red carpet treatment kind of thing, um, it makes me me pause and ask a question. And that question is, why is this starting to turn into a little pseudo-Hollywood? where we have only these personalities get booked and only, you know, this happens or it happens a certain way. Well, I think it's because in some ways it's become known how powerful free speech really is. And when you have a platform like the Internet that gives people who enjoy their free speech and have no problem speaking it, it gives people a voice into uh, being able to inject the collective consciousness was something very powerful, which opens up your psyche to the alternative possibilities of reality. And that's what we're really dealing with. And that's what Hollywood really is, is the center stone of the world's entertainment. It feeds every single country on this planet a form of entertainment, the mecca of entertainment is in Hollywood, California. So if you're sitting in, I don't know, some foreign country someplace, Hollywood in America is probably your, you know, idolized (laughs) form of entertainment somehow, some way. Branding, marketing, business, and deep Deep psychology is what runs entertainment. Now, think about the countries that maybe don't have such great internet or such great access to TVs and don't, you know, don't spend the westernized typical evening in front of the TV. These countries are probably your countries that are revolting, that are not happy with the way the world is running. How much, enter- how much is entertainment really a pacifier? Mm, yeah, it it does. I mean, it, it really does. Um, I mean, the past pacifiers is the perfect word for that. I mean, because it, it really does clamp down on any t- type of um, activism or participation in in society, and um and it's you know i i i'm just when you were talked about the you know looking at headlines and going deeper into the story and and to me it's um when when i turn on the tv and surf channels i mean i'm amazed at the um the similar coverage and headlines um that are beamed out you know i mean and it's um it really does to me it it just 
dumbs down America, or, you know, I mean, in, in the sense that they're, you're being spoon fed um, information and really not given any opportunity to think or evaluate or analyze or discriminate um, because there's so little choice coming through the airwaves. Well, you said something really interesting, and that's beamed out. And that's exactly what television and radio signals do. And when you watch a movie in a theater, your brain is operating on the same frequency it does when it dreams. And you can look that up online. You can Google that. And Google only accesses 4% of information. Let's not forget that, folks. But when you do Google it, take a look at what's, what pops up. Okay? When you go to the theater, which is entertainment, which is Hollywood, okay, because every actor on the planet dreams of getting to the big mecca of Hollywood, um, you're creating an illusion. I, I was able to tour Warner Brothers Studios while I was there and going on the back lots and seeing the sets for many popular TV shows. Of course, I don't watch any of them, so I was very out of it when it came to which shows or what, where. But mm-hmm. they build this entire universe, really, because they can do everything on site. They don't even have to go off site for gas or food or anything. Everything is right there. And they, they create these massive illusions and masterpieces of distraction and everything that goes into a production, which, by the way, Donald Trump is really good at, when everything goes into production, it is flawlessly executed by the these absolute endless budgets and phenomenal talents of people being able to do so. I'll give you an example. We were standing in the middle of this recreated town, which had been used to film many, 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 many different things. And in the center of this town was a was kind of a porch gondola type thing. And they had four trees around it. And we were being told that the trees can't always be in season for whatever they're filming. So if they're filming a fall scene and it's summer and the green, the green leaves are in full bloom, they hand pick the leaves off the tree to strip it and then tediously tie back on colored fake leaves to create a <laughs> no. leaf colored tree. No. Okay, so if you can imagine the amount of work that goes and effort that goes into that, and these people that are doing it, you don't know who they are. You've never, they're behind-the-scenes people. And I think what we forget to remember whenever we're looking at something that's deemed entertainment is that there's always a behind-the-scenes element to things. You're not always going to see the real everything of all because, like in The Wizard of Oz, which is a whole other subject, you get this person pulling the strings behind the curtains and this big illusionary type thing that everybody looks at as real. Well, that is really what happens in Hollywood is these illusions are created for everybody. They're, they're intentfully designed. They're put together with a mastery of magic and delusion. And people watch this as if it's reality, as if it's true, as if it's, you know, some people don't get caught up. I'm not mm-hmm. saying everybody does. But when you have a billion, gazillion dollar industry, somebody's making an awful lot of money out <laughs> of your right. um, hypnotized state of mind. Yeah? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Mesmerized. <laughs> um, exactly. You know, and um, to me, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's just amazing. I think one of the things that, uh, for me, the conversations or the transcripts in your book brought to light was just raising an awareness of the world around me and, and some of the things, you know, um, that – Maybe I thought I knew um, or, or things that I had no clue <laughs> about, you know, and, and, and just that, that process of um, getting me to question and to analyze and to discern, um, I, I feel that, you know, even beyond the topics in the book, that is a, a mindset um, that 
will continue for me. You know, I mean, it's one of those things where it's kind of like the the stories in the book were the seed of thought processes. You know, that that could be applied to other areas in your life around you. And I think, you know, that's that's one of the values, I think, of the book that I don't know if it was intended, but that is, for me, an effect of the book that I think is very valuable. Well, thank you. I take that as a great compliment. (laughs) I really do. (laughs) I really do because, you know, that was the intent of the book. The intent of the book is to offer, I don't, you know, however many copies go out into the world, it's out there. And whoever forever picks up a copy of that book, they're going to read it and they're never going to quite see the world the same way. And that is exactly what I'm hoping for. Because my own journey through information began kind of like on a spiritual path. You know, I was walking through my life doing my spiritual seeking and working with people and doing the inner work that I needed to do, that I wanted to do, that many of us put off and never do, um, ha- actually helped to reveal my passion. My voice certainly didn't start off. It was a little shaky when I first started radio, and you know, I'd read through my bios and get a little nervous, and <laughs> just things would happen, right? Live radio, got to love it. And uh, as I grew through my years of radio and I came to realize the incredible value of being able to have a conversation a week for years and years, over a decade, was really Mm -hmm. my spiritual awakening. That was my spiritual awakening, being able to say, I want to talk about this subject right now. And I, I I was working with an incredible team of people who made that all possible. And some people who didn't even really, you know, they weren't even on an official team, but they just, they were part of my life at the time or along the way, and they would inspire the kind of energy that helped me do it in many ways. I was inspired by many people along the path, and so I'm still really grateful. And now that I haven't done it for a little over a year, almost two years now, uh, it's one of the things I miss. I really enjoy good conversation. I really enjoy it a lot, uh-huh. actually. So I seek it out. And I have people in my life who can hold that vibration very well. And I treasure those right. people more than anything. Absolutely. Well, we're about halfway through the show, Hillary. So I want to take a quick break. And I do want to invite listeners, if you would like to call in and ask Hillary any questions, you can dial in at 619-789-4359. And for those of you listening live in the chat room, if you have any questions, feel free to post them there. And then when we come back from Hillary, I mean, come back from the break, Hillary, I want to kind of talk just about a few of the um, the guests and topics that you have, have in your book, uh, in particular um, LED lights and spy technology, um, Bitcoin, and time travel. You mentioned that a little bit. So I want to talk about those when we come back, okay? Sounds good. Look forward to it. Great. Okay, everyone stay tuned. We'll be right back in about 90 seconds. Hello, this is Robert Sharp. I want to thank you for joining us and hope you are enjoying today's show. Just a reminder that we have a wealth of information and resources available on our website, www.byteradio.me. There is a calendar of upcoming shows, along with an archive link that will give you access to more than 1,200 shows we have had over the past seven years. Also on the site are links to the products and services we provide, books, greeting cards, photography, and a wellness store. Our show is available as a free podcast on iTunes, and you can subscribe for free at the iTunes Store, or even quicker, there is a link on our website homepage. We are also on many social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc., and we also have buttons to those platforms on the top of our homepage. Our website, www.byteradio.me, has much for you to explore and enjoy. I also very much appreciate you supporting our guests, and especially today's guest. And now, back to the show. 
Okay, everyone. Thank you for staying with us again today. My very special guest is Hilary Ramo, and we are talking about um, her work, her radio work, and also her newly released book, The Hilary Ramo Show Transcripts. Um, it is a great book. I mean, you will you will learn a lot from her book. So uh, it's a definite uh, must get. And, and you can find out more about Hilary by visiting her website, which is hilaryramo.com. And that's H I L. L L A R Y R A I M O dot com. And again, I do have a direct link to her website in the show page description. Okay, so that we're back, Hillary. Hi everybody. <laughs> hey, great. Great. So a few of the topics that kind of really made an impression on me as I was going through and reading your book, um, I kind of would like to just touch on just to get the listeners, give the listeners an idea um, of the breadth of, of information that you provide. And, and one of them that you had in the chapter, you had the head of the ACLU, uh, the Council for Data uh, Privacy. His name is Chad Marlowe. But you discussed in, in that particular interview with him about how LED lights are being used used to implement an infrastructure of spy technology. I have to admit, I mean, as soon as I read that, I immediately looked up at my LED light about, hmm, what's going on here? You should. <laughs> but, uh, you should. Everybody should. Oh, I know. Everybody. But okay, I was, so I was can shocked. I, can I, you, you're going to let me leave, yes. go on this? Because if you're going to let me out of yes. this, it Please. might be hard to get me back in. <laughs> Okay, so I was doing a political show. Uh, I had been asked to host a political show, an online YouTube-type show, uh, through the campaign, and I figured what a great way to to work the energies that I was working on within this book proposal. So I agreed to do it, and the guests that they got from me were fantastic, and I was really intrigued to talk to them about certain topics because of my unique background. And uh, if you think about how many topics I've talked about over 13 years, I mean, I, I would want to talk to me if I were somebody else, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me get back on topic here. So the question was LED lights and spy technology. Now, I interviewed Chad Marlowe, the head, one of the head L, uh, ACLU's head counsel on data privacy. At the time, we were kind of going through little talks here and there on the campaign trail between the two of them. But if you ever noticed, neither one of them ever really smoked, spoke too much about it, okay? They were always talking about other things, and nobody really ever talked about this. It was kind of an off-topic for the candidates at the time. Now, Chad had a very unique perspective on things because he's the head counsel for the ACLU, and he's a very credible person, so anything coming out of here we might want to listen to because usually the ACLU is fighting for the people's rights and for people to not be taken over by the power of government. And uh, his conversation is really intriguing, and I have to say that I was very shocked, but not shocked, not shocked, when I got off that show with him, because in some ways we just had a very credible confirmation of what was happening at the time. And as we look at the progression of the digital age through the last, you know, several years, especially since 9-11, because all the, all the laws changed since 9-11. 9-11 gave um, kind of a, an open gateway to a very interesting set of phenomena on this planet that has enabled what we're all looking at today. And... I think it's important that we have to understand not everything is true. What a concept, right? I mean, just because we're told <laughs> something doesn't mean it's true. It's like gossip, right? If you're told something about somebody and that, present, that information hasn't come directly from direct experience or some, you know, that person's mouth, you have to assume it's third-party knowledge and you really have to take it with mm -hmm. a grain of salt. Okay. Anyway, the, the LED light structure system that Chad was speaking about in the show had to do with the fact that all LED light systems in public spaces basically at this point are, in fact, equipped with surveillance technology. A lot of this uh, came from the UK and other places because the UK, anybody who, have, who has ever been into Zone 1 in London knows very well that you cannot get away from the cameras anywhere you go, and that's partially because the royal family, the palace is there. You have the security type thing, right? 
Well, we have a security reason, too, thanks to 9-11. And remember all the Muslims that hate us and how that was really great to be racist at the mm-hmm. time as a country, and now we're facing how racism really does so much damage within our own country. We're facing a lot of that now still. And from a healing perspective, I think we really need to just heal this and move on, and we need to really work together, and whatever color our skin is, it really doesn't matter. And the empowerment comes from the fact that it goes all ways, right? Racism is not just a white and black thing. It's a, it's a white and brown, brown and black, brown and white. I mean, it goes all the way across the board, all the way across the full spectrum. Everybody who has ever had a thought that another person, race, color doesn't matter is less than them is a racist and any person who has ever judged anyone based on their looks or their skin color or the size of their bodies i mean there's so many different ways of discrimination that i can think of Mm -hmm. that would qualify as the energy of racism right so here we have a system that's in place and really doesn't care what color your skin is because it can track you wherever you are. We have a digital system that's been put into place over uh, centuries, really, when it comes down to it, to completely control the human race and population through a digital form of reality. And what does this all really do? It kind of disconnects us from nature, which I hope to get into a little bit later. Um, And... I'd like to focus on the energetic standpoints of this as well. But for the LED question, uh, Chad confirmed that that was happening, and everybody who has an LED light bulb in their house, it, all LED light bulbs have the ability to be equipped with spy surveillance technology. doesn't mean they are all equipped with it. It just means every right. single mm-hmm. LED light bulb has the, has the potential. So if you're visiting and you're staying in someone else's home or, you know, you're being offered a place <laughs> to stay or you're in a hotel and they know you're checking in and your light bulbs are LED, you, de- you definitely don't know what's going on in there and things can be changed very right. quickly. And this was all confirmed by the conversation I had with Chad Marlowe. Wow, it, I, I was just stunned at that, and you know, and and you know, that's one of those areas where I said that you know, now that I have this particular awareness, there's no going back. You know, there's, I mean, it's 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 there in, in the forefront of my mind, and and and, it, and that's a good thing. I mean, it, again, it, you know, it planted the seed of questioning and and looking around and being aware of of my surroundings, and um, you know, just. Uh, being a participant, you know, in in my life rather than just, you know, kind of being there, you know, and in, in existing. Um, so, um, again, that was one of those areas that I really wanted to highlight because, again, it got me thinking. Um, now, we we do have a caller. Um, his name is Bob, and he's calling from the Whit Sunday Islands. And let's see what Bob has to say. Hello, Bob. Hey, good morning, sir, and good morning, Hillary. It's a beautiful, beautiful dawning of the day here in the Whitsunday Islands. And what can I say? There's so much that you've shared, Hillary, that um, really resonates with me, which is (laughs) always encouraging for me. But I'll just share a few things that have been um, triggered by what you've shared. Um, When I consider the people that are running our society, they only have one modus operandi, and that is to divide and conquer. (laughs) And um, and, um, I do realize a long while back that everything I'd ever been taught and everything I believed was a lie. So I probably questioned everything in my life for the past 30 years. Um, And in my own journey, I've come uh, you know, um, I've achieved my goal, which is personal contentment. I am master and commander of my life and take full responsibility for everything that happens in my life. And I've come to realize now that um, my story, my journey, my truth is all that I have. And because everyone's equal and everyone's unique and everyone's sovereign, I realize that my story is only valid for me. And I'm more than happy to share my story in the hope that some of the things that I've learned, some of the tools I've picked up, will resonate with other people. 
But what's happening in society today is so blatantly obvious, and I haven't had a television, TV television, since 95, is it's all part of Agenda 21, isn't it? You know, um, uh, they want to decimate the human population, they want to keep us apart, because they're afraid of how powerful we can, we can be if we get back together in common unity and stand together and no longer accept this uh, corrupt regime. We're not supposed to live like this. We're supposed to live in joyous harmony. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for triggering um, that little um, line of thought. And uh, as I put put in the, the chat room, for me, um, my mind is just a tool that I use when I choose, for I am so much more than my mind. And... Um, and this one came to me the other day. Thinking is the weapon of mass distraction. I get through my life by feeling it. That bloke that said, I think, therefore I am, got it wrong. Because for me it's, I feel, therefore I am. Because I experience my life through my senses. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And thank you so much for not interrupting. Always a pleasure, man. Always a pleasure. Oh, I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, I'd like to say something, Bob, while I have you on the line. I'd like to thank you for calling in and for sharing that. That's very special, and a lot of people don't do that these days, and they should. And I have to share this in response to what you said. I was recently standing inside of Stonehenge a couple months ago. And I had the privilege of doing so with Maria Wheatley, who is one of the UK's most top expert on megalithic structures. And she brought up an interesting thing about phase one and phase two of Stonehenge and how the insides of the temple were changed. And I asked the question, well, what triggered the change between phase one and phase two? And she said, an eruption of a certain volcano I said, really? So we were smart enough to pay attention to the earth changes back then, but we're not smart enough to do it anymore. And it shows the progression and decline of our attachment and connection to nature, which in itself, if we restore it and honor and nurture it, we would be unable to kill and do the level of violence in which we do today. And I think that really triggered something. Our agricultural runoff, poisoning this and that. Our mind runoff, poisoning this and that. We have become direct microcosms of a larger problem. And until we learn to restore that connection, like we should be restoring the inside of Stonehenge, yet it should be different because that volcano has gone off within the last decade and nobody has noticed. And the stones lay there and uh, guarded by the military and nobody's allowed to touch them. So what do we do in those things? Can I respond, Hillary? Absolutely. Can I respond quickly? Well, darling, um, I used to live quite close to Stonehenge and was lucky enough to, to sleep overnight um, within the stones. In the, it was about 1970, 1971, and all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, you know, uh, and then I had the privilege to climb the Great Pyramid of Giza in 74, when uh, I was in the merchant naming and I had the same energetic sensation and now living in Australia I've been here since 89 and I've been to Uluru three times now as rock and it's the same sort of energy and I walked all the way around Ayers Rock with my hand on it because I said to the tribal elder that I had no intention of climbing on his church and he gave me permission to walk all the way around but I had to come out because there's places of secret women's business and I really appreciate that. But now, here I am in Australia and I do not own a pair of shoes. I walk this land barefoot. I feel it. And my closing statement, which is probably broad bush, uh, very, there's a lot of crackling going on. Can you still hear me? I can hear you, but there is yes. definitely mm -hmm. static. Yeah, okay, I'll just close with this. Um, uh, and my life is simple you know, living in my heart's in the driving seat not my mind but um, in 1969 I can remember being out in the backyard with my two best mates and saying hey Rod hey Dave man's got to stop this we're going to stop worshipping technology and get back to the cave if you like and so for me now um, 
Science is the sickness and nature is the cure. But the further away technology gets from working with nature, the sicker our society becomes. And that's just my observation. You know? So, yeah. But it's Thank for you, me, it's all that. about feeling. It's all about feeling. Feelings are healings. It's well, God forbid you depression. feel in this world today. God forbid you feel anything, especially love <laughs> and joy. I know. I, know. I wake up giggling. I wake up giggling. <laughs> 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 there you go. Well, well, well Thank thanks you. for calling in, Bob, and, and, and ha- thanks, have a good Bob. day. Rich. Bye. No worries, mate, as, as we say in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, you know, um, it's interesting, Hillary, because, I mean, you know, what he was talking about, and you kind of, you know, um, indicated prior to the phone call about the about the importance of nature and um, you know it's with the work that you have done um, what is your um, feeling about um, uh, you know technology and, and how it may be taking us away from our connection with nature and and maybe you know like you said in your um example of stonehedge you know that that um that connection you know kind of changed way back when you know the the approach you know when when it comes to the stonehedge architects um you know is, is do you feel that we are um going to maybe be forced in a way to reconnect with nature um, just because we're not giving her the due attention? Well, I think she's perfectly fine by herself. And we forget that we're a part of her. So even in our evolution, we're still aligning with her, but we're just not maybe conscious of it. And that conscious connection is what makes all the difference. And you can find that in conversation. You know, the line becomes crackly because you're raising the vibration because you're having the right conversation. And you're talking about the things that are important and need to be discussed. And you've stepped outside of that matrix of branding, marketing, numbers, sales, everything that keeps us tied into it. Right now, I bet you there's very few people on this planet who can do a job and make a living without some form of connection to an Internet digital signal, which is by plan. That's by plan. The infrastructures that have been created, you know, if you believe in ETs or UFOs, I mean, something coming from another planet and visiting us and needing to study us, the most brilliant way to do that would be to completely digitize everything about the human experience and study them. And the data centers Hmm. that collect all of these things, they're kind of like entities in their own sense, right? They're like an etheric library of sorts, holding all Mm -hmm. the documentation of everything. Our great achievement won't be something like the Giza Plateau or Stonehenge. Our great legacy will be the data centers and supercomputers that hold it all for eons and can be transmitted anywhere, including back in time. If you read my chapter with Dr. Uh, Tom Campbell, the NASA physicist who talks about consciousness at a very great level. His, his work is, is really just going to be something to be treasured as we grow uh, and evolve through our future. And he talks about seeing things as data. And Tom and I have worked together a couple times through the PATH series, uh, the documentary series put out by the PATH uh, 11 Productions years and years ago. And we went to London to do a Q&A talk before the premiere out there, and it was just Tom and I's cast members, and we had a quite engaging, beautiful audience, and the women all got what I said, and the men all got what he said, (laughs) okay, Uh because Tom will talk from a very... um, one brain, one side of the brain, I'm the other side of the brain, and I'm the creative, flowy, intuitive one, and so is he. But, you know, as a female, as a woman's voice coming out, it was interesting that the mm-hmm. women definitely understood what I was saying and how I was describing it, and the men got what Tom was saying. And, of course, across the board, everybody gets what Tom says, but it was interesting to observe that. And I think that's where we've gotten lost, is we've gotten lost in not really aligning with our true voices and where we really feel as who we are incarnated as right this minute. Okay, and Tom's 
Tom's work brings you back to the center of intuition and thought, consciousness, thinking things to reality, letting you know, interpreting how we in, uh, translate different energies coming into our lives or people popping up and having conversations. I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe in coincidences either. And as I was standing at the SB Awards um, two, yesterday, two days ago, um, all the victims of Larry Nasser, the Olympic trainer, who mm-hmm. sexually abused hundreds and hundreds of women over the course of his career, who's now serving a lifetime sentence in jail, um, came up and stood up, and that was the last part of this big, massive, perfectly executed production. And it had a big statement, but it didn't quite get the kind of standing ovation that some other things got, which I thought was strange. And although many people acknowledged it, it was one of these things that, you know, you're just kind of in awe of what goes on behind the scenes sometimes and how really dark and destructive it can be. You had a really powerful healing moment. So as a Reiki master, you know, I sat there in the middle of Hollywood, you know, done up to the T, wearing the costume, <laughs> doing Reiki symbols mm-hmm. on all of them, doing Reiki symbols on the audience, doing Reiki symbols on the people on stage because that's who I am, right? That's what I Mm -hmm. do. And I did the same thing with Sandy Hook when Sandy Hook happened because Sandy Hook is one of these kinds of events that we as human beings tend to get so obsessively traumatized by and can't turn the TV off. And if you don't have a TV, you still have access to Internet or you wouldn't be listening to the show. And the Internet is just as part of the television production as is your phone or your iPad or however you connect to the signal at all is how you're being studied. You are not able to get on a cell phone these days and not be studied. How how many people have a cell phone that will say, oh, you must be sleeping now or I can tell you're walking? (laughs) How completely Uh terrifying is that? I know. Okay, I because agree. we've been trained to mm-hmm. hold our, we've been trained, I'm sorry, am I running out of time? We've been trained to hold our cell phones <laughs> the way we hold our identities. I agree, I agree. And we are, we're running out of time, and we're down to five minutes. And, and I just literally touched the tip of the iceberg. It was it was like that 4% of a Google, you know, of all information. That's right. I, that's, so right. <laughs> that's right. No, that, that's a really interesting but, fact, uh, and anybody listening to that is really needs to do their research on that. You think you yeah. know what you're talking about. When you Google something, you get the answer. It's like that magic eight ball we all grew up with when before the Internet even existed. You <laughs> shook it, and something would come up to the surface and go, maybe... And you go, oh, my God, that's exactly (laughs) right. That's my fate. We have spent far too long handing our power over to structures that are unsustainable for this planet, and we have to start taking that back. I agree. I agree. And and now the the areas also that I I loved that um, we weren't able to get to was the the Bitcoin in, in the dark web. That was a, a great conversation that you had with uh, Stuart Trustee, um, and then you just you mentioned um, you know Dr. David Lewis Anderson, the time travel technology guy, and, and the difference between time control and time travel. Never even knew of a difference between the two, so I know that was very enlightening. So you know, again, you really chose some great guests to um, have the shows. Chain, uh, written down in, in transcript form, so they're really, really good. I enjoyed it. So, I, guess, I hope I have no, honored. Um, I, I hope I have honored everybody that I had on in this book because each person I had a very, I resonated with. I enjoyed what I learned from their shows, and they had some effort and 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 catalytic type way of of inspiring me to keep doing it. So these are very close to my heart. Yeah. Yeah, they were were excellent selections. So I guess in in closing, is there any, maybe any final words that you may want to um, pass on to the listeners, maybe anything about uh, the book or the transcripts or maybe what you hope they'll take away from reading reading the book? Sure. I hope that you... 
find a conversation in the book that is your favorite and you go find somebody else to talk to about it and you have a fantastic conversation about the material. That's what I hope. I also like to mention that at the end of this month, I'll be at the MUFON conference in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the 49th annual conference. I will be in the vendor section doing a, bo- a book signing and um, I hope to meet people there and talk about the book and the topics. Dr. Phil Corso, his transcript is in this book as so is Dr. Stephen Greer's and uh, there's quite a few other ones that complement the, the material that the, both of them talk to. Dr. Carol Rosen is in the book. And uh, all of this has to do with technology. And all of this has to do with the progression of UFO context. And we're still having the conversation. Are we alone in the universe? I mean, we need to grow up. That's my message. <laughs> we need to graduate kindergarten and go right to graduate school and start acting like a bunch of grown-ups that are free-thinking, beautiful manifestations of consciousness. That's what I wish for everybody to get out of this book. That is great. That is great. Well, we're not, we're now connected on Facebook, so I'm really looking forward to, to following your journey and um, and just keeping in touch. So, again, I, I want to thank you for your time today, Hillary. I, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Well, thank you, Robert, very much for having me, and thank you for doing this show so that we could have this conversation and others could enjoy it. Great. Again, everyone, today my very special guest has been Hilary Ramo, and we've been talking about her work as well as her newly released book, The Hilary Ramo Show Transcripts. Um, again, you can find out more about Hilary by visiting her website, which is hilaryramo.com, H-I-L-L-A-R-Y. R-A-I-M-O dot com. And again, I do have a direct link to her website in the show page description. So everyone, I want to thank you for joining us for this edition of the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. And until we meet again. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Bringing Inspiration to Earth show. Be sure to visit our website at www.byteradio.me that's B-I-T-E-R-A-D-I-O dot M-E. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Byte Radio Me. And our shows are also available as a free podcast from iTunes. And until we meet again, remember to be a bright light by bringing inspiration to your world and to the lives of those you touch. This Friday, suit up. Mission Impossible Fallout is 95% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. It's one of the best action movies ever made. Showtime. Rolling Stone calls it off the charts spectacular. What is he doing? I find it best not to look. A thrillingly clever story filled with twists and turns. Target Ethan Hunt. We should be dead. Why aren't we? With an ending that will blow you away. We interrupt. And Tom Cruise. Mission Impossible Fallout. Friday. Rated PG-13. May be inappropriate for children under 13. Hi, it's Jamie. Progressive number one, number two employee. Leave a message at the... Hey, Jamie. It's me, Jamie. This is your daily pep talk. I know it's been rough going ever since people found out about your acapella group, Mad Harmony. But you will bounce back. I mean, you're the guy always helping people find coverage options with the Name Your Price tool. It should be you giving me the pep talk. Now get out there, hit that high note, and take Mad Harmony all the way to nationals this year! Sorry, it's pitchy. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law.